Welcome to Half Hour With. I'm Pete Hammond, your host. And today, our subject is a terrific documentary, an unexpected documentary. When you hear the words blood, sweat, and tears, you think music documentary. This is this is more like a political thriller, if it's anything. It's, it's an untold story until now. And amazing that we have not only its producer, director, writer, he's done so many uh, docs in the past, uh, particularly focused a lot in the music world, uh, the U.S. versus John Lennon. Um, uh, Harry Nielsen was one of his subjects. The Beach Boys, Brian Wilson has been one of his subjects. John Coltrane, on and on. But he always finds interesting angles with this and all the many, many other documentaries he's done. This is John Scheinfeld. Hi, John. Hi, Pete. Nice to be with you. We have the co-founder of that, The Drummer, and Bobby Columbi has worked in every aspect of the music industry, both in front and behind the scenes here. He's worked for Warner Brothers Music, Epic Records, Capitol Records, EMI Manhattan, um, Sony Music, you name it. Many different artists and all kinds of things. And then, of course, uh, Blood, Sweat and Tears, which I think you're still involved with in, in the latest iteration of this group. Uh, Bobby Columbi, right here. Hey, Bobby. Hi. Hi, Pete. Good to see you. Well, uh, congratulations on this. Uh, uh, when I say unexpected, I think, you know, all these music documentaries you think you're going to see sort of the same thing. But, John, I think you're always looking for a different way in, a different angle to get you interested in doing this. So what was it about this story? And when I say political thriller, that's just part of it um about blood sweat and tears going on a tour of eastern europe and behind the iron curtain as it were romania poland um czechoslovakia no yugoslavia and uh, those three countries basically well what fascinated me about this is that yes it is not your typical music documentary it's not a history of the band this is a moment in time when America was as polarized as it is now, we're talking about the summer of 1970. And we have one of the biggest bands in the world at that time, and they get stuck in the middle of this political rat's nest. And I just thought this was such a fascinating way uh, into this story. It involves the Nixon White House, Henry Kissinger, uh, the State Department, the governments, uh, as you say, Romania, uh, Poland, and, and Yugoslavia. Uh, and uh, and cancel culture before we really knew what that was. And I thought all of these elements together made for just a spectacular story. Uh, and so when Bobby first told me the general outline of it, I thought this is something I had to do. Bobby, you've been involved, uh, it, you know, with the group, obviously, right from the beginning and now. And why did why now? How did this story just pop up half a century later, a story we really didn't focus on? In fact, is almost impossible to find, I think, the footage that was shot during that time, too. So this was hidden. How did it come up? How did you hook up with John here? Um, I saw a documentary that John did. It's called uh, about John Coltrane. And we had dinner and we just were talking about stuff. And he and he told me at dinner, you know, I really like Blood, Sweat and Tears a lot. What the hell happened to Blood, Sweat, and Tears? <laughs> exactly. Literally, that was my question. <laughs> and I said, and it's, you know, it's, a, it's a long story, and it's just part of my life. But for me, the most fascinating thing is to relive something that you went through 50 years ago through John's lens. I'm seeing something that, you know, I forgot about. Life one obviously goes on, but this. You know, I forgot what a for us and just generally what a monumental wild time it was. And John captures it. The thing about it is, and I have friends that have seen this, and every one of them said, I had no idea. <laughs> That's kind of the way it 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 comes off. I'm I mean the real takeaway is I had no idea. Gee, that was a great group. What a what crazy things happened, and I've obviously seen it many times. Every time I see it, I like it more, and I discover more things because I was in the middle of it. It's very hard to see things when you're in the middle. And John's, he you know he makes documentary films, 
So for him, the story, whatever it is, has to be so captivating and so interesting for him to want to proceed because it's, again, it becomes a part of his life that he's investing in time and energy. And and he kind of sucked me into all kinds of stuff that I wouldn't have done normally. <laughs> but it and was... You know, you know, Pete, another thing I think that, that struck me is, is there are many parallels uh, uh, between what happened uh, to Blood, Sweat and Tears in 1970 and what the environment and the political landscape was like and what it is like today. And I think that's what makes our film uh, just as relevant today as opposed to simply exploring a fascinating story from the past. Yeah, it seems like now is absolutely the right time uh, to bring this story again. History repeats itself. As we say many times, we're going to take a look at the trailer for the movie to give everybody a taste of uh, what it is overall here. So here is uh, a look at what the hell happened to Blood, Sweat and Tears. We're just musicians, man. We just went to play some music for people. And it turned into this huge political rat's nest. What goes up? Blood, Sweat and Tears are one of those bands whose moment is so big. Spinning wheels. We were the number one band in the world. Talking about your troubles, it's a Sponsored by the State Department, are you nuts? It just made them look uncool. Going to Eastern Europe was not going to be forgiven by the counterculture. There was an underlying reason why we did this tour. We were blackmailed. Nobody had any idea how East European audiences would react to music that communists have been banning. The contract says that the show must be decent. <laughs> I think we were naive. I don't think we realized how it would bounce up and bite us. The presence of a film crew was a game changer. My vision was to make a concert documentary. When we arrived, things changed. The first thing that we saw when we got off the plane were guards with submachine guns. You could feel the Iron Curtain slam behind you. We were being followed. We were being monitored. I stepped out of the hotel and took a picture, and two guys grabbed me just like that. The audiences were fantastic. They were really starved for this kind of music. They are looking at freedom, and they're reacting to it. Kids were jumping up out of their seats with peace signs going, USA, USA. This was a bit much for the authorities. Soldiers started to move in. One kid just wanted an autograph. The police beat the crap out of it. Those images will never leave my brain. Regimes, they tried to put their best foot forward when visitors came. That night, the regime took the mask off. There's so much more to this story. You have no idea. That's, that's interesting. What goes up must come down. You know, it was sort of like Blood, Sweat and Tears was at the peak of anybody's career then. They had three major hit singles off, off their second album. They won the Grammy album of the year. Everything was going well. And then somehow the State Department wants them to go on this tour, John, and everything kind of blew up. Uh, there was a, a, a problem with their lead singer, David Clayton Thomas, because he was Canadian and the State Department got involved and there was a bit of a quid pro quo here. And uh, in return for doing this tour, David had some immigration problems that magically went away. But um, this is what makes this story so interesting. Again, it's not just a history of a band. There's so much more going on. And what they found them, these are young guys. They were like in their mid 20s. Uh, most of them had not been out of the United States, much less behind the Iron Curtain, which was then the most repressive uh, countries in the world at that time. And they really had their eyes open uh, as to um, what they ex uh, experienced there. And so all of this really makes uh, for a, a multi-layered story that I think was very worthy of being up on the big screen. Yeah. So, Bobby, when you look at it again and you look at all you when you did you have a a very sharp memory of everything that was going on or does it all come back to you? Did it go into the back of your mind somewhere here? Some of it I remembered pretty clearly. I have luckily a good memory and we took photos. And the thing that happened is when we went, 
a an independent film company decided they wanted they thought it would be be a great you know movie or television show so they kind of called us and said can we shoot this and we said well yeah but i you know but we got to like it and so they cleared it with the state department and they went up there and so there are there's an hour's worth of footage which john can explain i mean and again you see it in the movie so you're there you see what's going on. This story couldn't be told without seeing some of the events in real time that happened 50 years ago. So my memory was renewed, obviously, by seeing the film. And also, you know, listen, I, I mean, I really enjoyed that. I, I love that band. I, I, you know, I thought we did great things musically. And now I look back at it and I'm still very proud of the band. One of the things I love most about my job is the detective work. We're always looking for unseen film and photos. And um, when when I, I, I'm sitting at dinner with Bobby and just very casually into conversation, he says, oh, you know, there was a, a, a documentary film crew with us. There was film. There's film on this story. <laughs> like, wow. Um, so we cast a very wide net. Uh, and what we learned is, is that the film crew shot 65 hours of footage. And they came back to L.A., to edit it into what they felt was going to be a, a documentary for theaters uh, across the country. That footage has disappeared. I we don't know where, where it is. We, we suspect what happened to it and we, we talk about that at the end of the film. But what we did find, thanks to a, a, a wonderful woman here in Los Angeles, um, in a far corner of a vault, uh, in a pile of material that was marked for destruction, we found a 60 minute cut of this documentary that was intended for television, never was shown. And, and uh, had it not been for that footage, we could not have made our film, but, but it is, and it's a wonderful foundation for telling this great story. You would have had to recreate everything, send Bobby back <laughs> to Romania, walking the streets. <laughs> you know, it, it's funny you say that because it was the most repressive place I've ever been in my entire life to this moment. And I've spoken to people that have been there recently. So it's completely different. I'm still not, a, I, I'm still not so sure I'd get on that plane. <laughs> no, that's, that's crazy. The um, 65 hours, we don't know where that went, but you were able to get the rights and use this. And did you contact the, is the director still alive that uh, shot that footage? That uh, I, he obviously is in the film being interviewed here. So the uh, the director of it was a, a gentleman named Don Camburn, wonderful guy. This was his first opportunity to direct a film, and that's what you see when you see the film. Is you see the emotion coming from him of how saddened he was that this was never released. Um, it, it meant so much to him. Um, uh, but he has had tremendous recall and he filled in uh, a, a very specific portion of our story where, where we get to talking about Cold War spy stuff. <laughs> and he saw things that even Bobby and the band members didn't see. Yeah. And he reveals that in the film. Uh, sadly, um, he, he died earlier this year uh, and, and uh, uh, was not able to see the film. Um, his, his girlfriend, uh, Don was 91 when he passed away, uh, and his 88-year-old girlfriend came to, to see it at one of our theatrical uh, screenings, and uh, she was just in tears, uh, not only at how powerful the story is, but to see Don up there being so wonderful and, and, and seeing his recall for this. Yeah, that that's uh, amazing um, that you got him in uh, on this during COVID. You you had to do a lot of these interviews, all of this on top of everything else that's difficult about making films. You made this during COVID. Well, you bet. I mean, Don's a good example. Is uh, He was in a, an assisted living facility uh, in Burbank, California, and they wouldn't let him out and they wouldn't let us in. And so we were sort of poised for many, many months uh, to, to try to get uh, his uh, uh, memories into this film. And finally, uh, there was like a, a, a two month period where they opened the doors and we were like, great. So we got him out and, uh, and, and we were able to shoot this wonderful interview. And, and it was much the same with the band members who are scattered across the country. And then David Clayton Thomas, the lead singer who lives in Toronto, we had to wait for the borders to open. So that all, yes, caused us some uh, additional challenges. But 
uh, I think we're really, really proud of the result. I was going to ask you about getting getting the band back together here. You you got uh, like about five different members. Uh, a couple have passed away, I guess. Bobby, you, were you instrumental in convincing them to do this? John made the uh, the calls. Um, he got in touch with it. I mean, John's a detective. He makes films, but he's a, he found he was on a ladder in my house looking up top of shelves. I'm going, what the hell are you up to? He goes, what's this? What's this? He actually found something I didn't even know existed. <laughs> And then a lot of us at the time were into photography. I know I was, I still am. And John looked through a thousand slides, probably and more, probably. And 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 I believe even if the film, if even if you didn't find the film, John, I bet you still could have made this thing. Because <laughs> because the, the work he did in putting this together is just phenomenal. I I I wanna now I wanna go see it again. You know, like I, I got stuff to do. <laughs> you know, Pete, I think it was one of these things. This story has been burning in the brains of, of the band members for, yeah. for 50 years now. I think there was quite this was an opportunity for them to really um, express their feelings about what happened yeah. and, and why it happened and how it happened. And then, of course, the impact of what happened. And I think they were quite willing to talk. And as, as people will see when they see the film, these are uh, guys with very different personalities um, but very powerful memories. Let's uh, take a look at a, a clip here where they are talking uh, about what they were going through here uh, 50 years later uh, from that perspective. And I think the realization that we were in a world of trouble at that point, that going to Eastern Europe was not going to be forgiven by the counterculture. There was a definite anti-blood, sweat, and tears sentiment that was palpable. Usually, when you're attacked for your political point of view, it's from the left or the right. We, on the other hand, were attacked by both sides. The right was angry with us because we were anti-Vietnam, anti-government, anti-Nixon. But we were also attacked by the left because of the association with the State Department I felt canceled because people thought we were something that we weren't. It made me want to retreat. I was very, I was, it, it broke my heart, actually. That, that's what fascinates me about this. You mentioned cancel culture uh, early on, John, and that's not a term that's come up, you know, in the last few years. But it they were, they were stuck between a rock and a hard place. And I remember... At the time, yeah, I was very political at the time, but I never thought of blood, sweat, and tears as a particularly political act or, or group or anything. They became victims of this. We and weren't polit You know what? Each of us, all of us, we had our own separate minds. I doubt any of us would have voted for Nixon. I'm sure we didn't <laughs> if we voted at all. And we were part of, of a movement of a very anti anti Vietnam. I mean, that was our, our age group. But I don't think we ever had one conversation amongst ourselves saying, so where do we stand on these issues? We just did things as they came along. We did everything we could to raise like, the consciousness of what happened at, at Kent State, because that was going to go away. And we did a fundraiser with Neil Young as the opening act in Cleveland to raise enough money for the ACLU to reopen the case. So, so we were under the radar political, but never as a unit. I mean, we never organized anything. The State Department threw you under the bus or, or oh. something, basically here, <laughs> literally under well, the. Are you asking me or John? Both, uh, you know, it seems Let's like. Let's answer first because he's more objective. <laughs> well, I, I don't think Pete, it was the State Department throwing them under the bus. I think what the State Department did was they got by strange set of circumstances, they got one of the top bands in the world to tour on their behalf and spread the image, uh, the message of uh, America and democracy behind the Iron Curtain. What, what really impacted the band was when they got home and the, the left wing led by Abby Hoffman and some of the other activists at the time made a connection that proved to be untrue. They felt that somehow by working for the State Department, the band was therefore working with the CIA 
that right. made them pigs in their mind and, and, and worthy of, of derision and everything else. But the problem was, you know, and, and Pete, you see this all the time with films, um, uh, stars, directors, and films have a moment where things are all working beautifully. The reviews are terrific. The response is terrific. Everybody's loving something. Uh, but then that moment can be over. And that's what happened to Blood, Sweat and Tears. They had this moment where they were one of the biggest bands in the world. And then suddenly they weren't. And it was because of all of this noise that came as a result of them making this tour. Suddenly they weren't getting the same press they were getting. They weren't getting the same concert reviews. Well, no, they... We were getting press, but it was with a different point of view. <laughs> Very but much so. I got the sense that that it was spiraling out of control and 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 we you know any association state department sponsored tour just killed us abby hoffman and company just for them it was a great you know, photo op so they could be seen and look what they're doing and we were the victims and we were the victims really from both ends and john grab he john was able to, i'm sorry to give something away here john was able to find some of the people that went to those shows yeah. at the time in Romania, in Poland, in Yugoslavia. It was unbelievable. And I'm watching these people talk about the impact it had for a U.S. band of our stature to appear there. And, you know, this is all, again, even though I was there, this movie took me away and I'm watching things and learning of tons of things I didn't know about, you know. You you won't remember this, but many years ago, you and I got into a conversation about Alfred Hitchcock, and we were talking about what, what sort of is the essence of his films. Yeah. And it's always like a, an innocent person is caught up in an intrigue, not of their own making. That's it, Cary Grant, and, North by Northwest, that kind of thing. And that's what happened here to these 25-year-old kids in Blood, Sweat and Tears. Innocent musicians, all they wanted to do was play music, and they did it brilliantly. And they're caught up in this international intrigue that followed them back from Eastern Europe to, to America. And again, that to me made for just a really compelling story. Yeah, you know, and putting it together, Bobby, I'm just wondering, you also did the score. You're now a film composer. You did the score where you like, I, I'm a music guy here. I'm going to come out and it's I'm the gonna... exact opposite. He came to me and he said, you know, you're kind of like the musical shaper of this band, which is close. And he said, I want you to do the score. I don't want some completely different music. And also I come cheap. I didn't charge <laughs> anything. But, but he, you know, and I said, absolutely not. I can find you some great writers that can draw. He said, no, you do it. I said, no, I don't want to do it. And he just kept bugging the crap out of me. And, and it just kept coming. And finally, I said, I got an idea. You know, wait a minute. I got a friend always in my life when I all the records I've ever produced, because I don't notate music that I have friends that are great arrangers and composers that I work with and they can read me and they know, you know, when I describe the instrumentation, the kind of chordal stuff I'm looking for, the the vibe, they get me. And and one of these people is is a wonderful musician, arranger, composer named Dave Mann. And I had been working with him on some stuff like fairly recently. I said, are you down to do something like this? He said, sure. And he was, he was tremendous. I mean, valuable is not the word. I think if I didn't show up, it probably would have sounded pretty close to the same. He was, he, he was, he was wonderful, but I loved the process. And if you don't mind me extending this uh, answer, one of the crazy things that happened is I'm mixing, I'm in the studio and John found, again how the hell he did that some tapes of the audio of our concerts and one concert in particular which i remember being a really good concert for us the audience was great it was in warsaw and it was only eight tracks or seven tracks but i go in the studio with alan sides who's a fantastic engineer and we start like to go through this music and mix it you know for stereo mix it for surround and and it actually sounds fantastic, you know, at home and in the theater, which is the good news. But I never liked my drumming. It just was the, it, no, no, it was the least thing I cared about in life. I mean, I it, I enjoyed playing, but I didn't intend to make a career being a drummer. And for the first time in my life, I get this feeling that I'm 
a doctor and I'm operating on myself 50 years ago <laughs> and I'm listening to the drumming and I I was I was really happy with the way I played and 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 you know I told John I said I would go hear that kid he's good the kid can play <laughs> you know that. and I mean that was you know one of the of the takeaways for me you know so so you get an idea of how objective I am looking at this movie and then going back into the time and being thrown back into a time machine and reliving a lot of the stuff and also learning probably more than I relived. I learned more about the, everything that went on because I didn't see everything that the other band members saw. We were all around doing different things. So when they would be interviewed and give their stories, I'm going, you know, I'm, I'm hearing it for the first time also. That's amazing. You know, uh, is there a soundtrack CD coming out of uh, this discovery of the actual, when yeah. you're talking about a discovery of the tracks, it's not the footage of you playing, it's the actual uh, recording of oh, yeah. the whole show, right? Uh, with the documentary film crew, they brought a portable eight track tape machine with them on, on the tour. Not the kind of eight track people used to have in their cars, but this is a studio eight track machine and they recorded all of their concerts. And um, because they needed to have the sound for the film. Yeah. And for the longest time, we could not track down uh, these tapes. And uh, by quite uh, an, an accident, uh, we found five of them at the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences <laughs> Library. The associate producer on the documentary that never came out, uh, for some reason, saved five of these tapes. And across the five tapes, were um, all but one of the songs that the band played on, on the concert tour. So we mi uh, Bobby mixed them with Alan and we have a, a CD soundtrack of all of the performances available from uh, those concerts. And you're absolutely blown away by how, how strong and vital and vibrant this band was. Uh, you know, there's that old ad where, where a guy is sitting in a chair and the speakers are blowing and backward, you know, yeah. this is what happened to me the first time I heard these tapes and this music. And the and music the doesn't sound second. dated, doesn't sound dated at all, which is no. the point that I'm excited about. And the, uh, so all of those tracks are on a CD uh, soundtrack, also available di digitally, and then just available uh, digitally are, are the dramatic portions of the score that Bobby and Dave, uh, David wrote. And they just captured the the every emotion and color and texture that we needed in this film. Did such a great job, and the music it really stands on its own. You can listen to that quite easily uh, without the pictures, and you'd still appreciate it. But with the pictures, it's really spectacular. Yeah, for any composer, you know, this movie opens with the Russians invading and things like that. That's not typical blood, sweat, and tears music. Well, Pete, <laughs> Pete, I'm a fan of Prokofiev. Who was, ah, a Russian, okay. who was a Russian, <laughs> a great Russian composer. And I would sit with Dave Mann and go, okay, so if you listen to Lieutenant Kiji Suite, go to his fifth <laughs> symphony, this section, that section, the, this is the instrumentation. Here's a melody I, I think would work for this. And, and uh, that's exactly what happened. And you're right. You know? I can't believe when you said you actually tracked down some of the concert goers like in Romania or wherever you were, you know, because you look at that footage of them and it, they, clearly they were loving this. Yeah. And clearly the governments were hating it there because this is bringing everything they hate about democracy <laughs> in the West and everything. That sounds <laughs> familiar. There's still, there's still fans out there, huh? Yeah. Oh, that, yeah. <laughs> well, what we did was, um, I also wanted to get into the files of the secret police in those three countries. Uh, because uh, the band, as, as you saw from the trailer, the band was under surveillance uh, uh, in all three of those communist countries. And uh, so we, we found some researchers in uh, Romania and Poland that were able to get into those files and we see some of the results of the documentation that they found. But then they also used local social media to reach out uh, to people to say, hey, if you were at these concerts, uh, please let us know. And we found five people that were at these concerts. And again, I think uh, what we have here is some moments of great emotion. Yeah. You see in the eyes of these people just how important these concerts were to them, the significance of these concerts, the freedom that it represented that unfortunately they weren't able to experience for another 20 years. Um, but they still, all these years later, it's like, you know, a lot of us go to a lot of concerts. Oh, I think, you know, I went to that when I remember a little bit about it. 
they remembered everything because so many interesting things happened, including a semi-riot in Bucharest, which we detail in the film. Yes, <laughs> I know. I that's think, a... Excuse me, I don't think it was semi. <laughs> <laughs> you know, at, all, at all you know when you set a place on fire it's not semi anymore <laughs> well uh, our time our half hour with is almost come to an end but we always have a question here that we like to ask uh that for people that haven't seen the film or maybe that are now intrigued to see it again to see all the things and there's so much in this that you you won't notice the first time what do you think is is the thing you would say i'll ask both of you uh, that is the most important takeaway here that makes this uh, urgent viewing, that makes this must-see viewing that you want people to see uh, now out of this film. The best way I can answer that is to tell you, one day we were sitting in editing and we were looking at footage of the Russians uh, tanks rolling into Prague in 1968 to stifle the revolution. And all we could think about were Russian tanks rolling into Ukraine to stifle that government. And I think what struck us is just how relevant so many of the elements of the story, story about uh, Blood, Sweat and Tears in 1970, how, how relevant so many of those elements remain today. So I think people who, who come to see this film or come to see it again are going to feel that, oh, my goodness, it is so relevant today in terms of what's going on. What about for you, Bobby? Well, a lot of what John is saying is is exactly my sentiment, but also the best way to 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 not screw up your life and repeat idiotic things that have happened historically is to learn the history of what happened, so you don't make those mistakes again. And this country is at the precipice of about to make those mistakes again. And I think if in a weird little way this movie is going to remind people, you don't want this. Right. Cautionary tale. Cautionary tale, indeed. Uh, a movie that shouldn't be categorized as anything except a, a great a, movie by John Chinville. Yeah. <laughs> and and, uh, and featuring uh, Bobby Columbia uh, there. Uh, <laughs> and your music. Uh, congratulations to both of you, John Chinville, Bobby Columbia. Thanks for uh, spending a half hour with us today. My pleasure. Great to be with you. Thank you.